Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this uh, John 17, which is the Lord's Prayer, and we pray that <clears throat> you would teach us from it in Jesus' name. So we will be in uh, the title of our lesson is The Prayer of the Son. It is about John chapter 17, which is the Lord's Prayer. We normally call Matthew 6 or Luke 11 the Lord's Prayer, but those are disciples' prayers because they are asking for forgiveness of sin. The Lord is sinless, and so thus does not need to ask for forgiveness from sin. But this one, this is Jesus' longest prayer in Scripture, and uh, it's part of the Upper Room Discourse. It's kind of the end of the Upper Room Discourse. If we're going through our outline, you know, we had the beginning, which is the heavenly genealogy, and then the second portion was Jesus' public ministry. Upper Room Discourse is his, the third portion, which is his private ministry, and we're just toward the end of that. So the first section, section A, Jesus prays for God's glory. That's chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. There's a lot about glory there, isn't there? So if you look at verse 1, he says, Father, the hour has come. So we've noticed that through this gospel, right, that Jesus pays attention to timing. Remember in uh, chapter 2 at the wedding in Cana, his mother said, they have no wine. And he said, why do you ask me? He said, my time has not come. And he said that several times. He actually said it in John chapter 7, verse 6, in John chapter 7, verse 8. In uh, John chapter 8, verse 20, he would remind people all the way through that his hour has not come. But here, he says the hour has come. So that gives us an indication of what hour he's talking about. What hour was that? This is the night before what? His crucifixion. This is the night before his crucifixion. So that's the hour that he's talking about. The hour, the reason he came to earth, the reason he was put into a body, was to pay the price for the sin of every single person throughout history from Adam to the last person born ever. So that is the hour that he's talking about. So Jesus, verse 2 says that the Father gave him authority over all flesh. And then he says, and well, he actually doesn't say here, but he has authority over all flesh in that since Jesus is the Son of Man, which is the designation given in Daniel chapter 7, all judgment has been given to him. And he told us that back in John 5 and verse 22. He says, For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. So whenever there's a judgment going on, Jesus is the one doing it. And there'll be four judgments, right? There'll be our judgment for believers, church-age believers, the Bema Seat, for reward. There'll be a judgment, two judgment, uh, judgments of living people at the end of the millennium, one for the Jews, one for the Gentiles, and that judgment will be determined if they're a believer or not. Believers will go into the millennial kingdom. Unbelievers will be executed by Jesus. And then there's the great white throne judgment of the unbelieving dead after they're resurrected. And they'll be judged based on their works for a degree of punishment. And Jesus is the judge of all those events. So he has authority over all flesh. And the other part of this verse that's interesting is, uh, again, we get the concept of election here, which shows up every now and then. Here's the divine side of election. He says that to all whom the Father has given him, he may give eternal life. So that's an indication that the Father gives Jesus certain people to give eternal life to. We know that the human side of election is that salvation is open to all who will believe. I'm not going to get into that because it's very confusing and we've done it over and over. But yeah, the human side of election is in 1 John 2.2. 2. And that is the fact that <clears throat> this goes against the doctrine of Calvinism, of a limited atonement. Calvinists teach that they're only the elect 
that Jesus died for only the elect, which contradicts this verse. First John 2, chapter 2, he himself, that is Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. So anybody who wants to be saved can be saved. It is open to all. That is unlimited atonement. And then verse 3, Jesus defines eternal life. What do we think of when we think of eternal life? The secular world thinks of it as long-lasting life, right? Everlasting life, eternal life. So the, the fact of the matter is that everybody has eternal existence, but they that's what they think of. They think of life that lasts eternally. And we people do have an existence that lasts eternally, but the unbelieving is an existence of pain and regret and grief and the absence of the Lord, whereas the believer has... Uh, a life of bliss, fellowship, joy, and purpose. And so there is an incredible difference. And Jesus here tells us that eternal life is knowing God and Jesus Christ. That is the definition of eternal life. The other is eternal death, really, because death is separation, and spiritual death is separation from God. So that means that we have eternal life right now, because you know God when you are saved. The Holy Spirit comes in and dwells. So eternal life started for each one of us at the moment of belief. For me, it started on a little house in Spokane when I was seven years old. And we want everyone to experience that. We don't want anyone to experience the eternal death. So that's why we keep trying, even though they many times do not listen. We keep trying. Then verse 4 Jesus glorified the Father on earth. It says Jesus, he was confident that the completion of his work on earth would bring honor to his Father. And then they relate it to us. It says in the same way, we should commit ourselves to completing the tasks God has given us to do, no matter how difficult or intense the opposition. Because when you follow the Lord, when you're serious about following the Lord, opposition rises up. If you don't follow, you know, if you're a believer and you don't do anything, you don't follow the Lord, there will not necessarily be much opposition. Opposition rises up because Satan doesn't want you, you to be effective. He wants to take you out. He wants to disqualify you, even though you're saved. And that is the walk of discipleship. And then again, Jesus says, I glorified you on the earth. So there's a lot about glory here. Glory is a big deal. Glory is a big deal. Isaiah 42, 8 God says, I will not share my glory with another. So do we want glory, you and me? Do we like glory? We do like glory. Do we want glory? These are, tr these are trick questions. Trick kind of. You know, who else wanted glory? <clears throat> there was a certain angel that wanted glory. Yes. He wanted glory. And he had glory, right? He was the anointed cherub who covers He's a very, very high-ranking angel, probably the highest-ranking angel, but he wanted more glory. He liked his glory. He wanted more, and that is not the way to get it. So how is the way to get glory, personally? How do you get glory in Jesus' economy? So Philippians 2.3 tells us, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Okay, so serve. Then in Luke 22, 25 and 26, and he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors, but it is not this way with you. But the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. So the way to glory in Jesus' economy is going down. You intentionally put yourself under others and serve them. You take care of them. You do what they need. Okay? You put them first. That is the way to glory. And uh, Peter says it well. He says, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you, which is glory. When? In due time. Jesus, think of where he started, God, eternal God, in glory, in unapproachable light. He humbled himself to become a human, and not just like a human in a palace, but a human born in a barn, a common laborer, and killed as a criminal. 
So he humbled himself the most. And so now he has the name that is above every name because that same principle he applied to himself. You know, he said the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So that's the principle for glory in Christ's kingdom. It is to humble yourself and be a servant and put others ahead of yourself, and God will exalt you in due time. Glory is not to be grasped. Glory is a gift to be given from God. Glory is to be given to God's servants, and he will do it. So we have to be patient. We have to be patient and and serve, you know. So, and the Lord will give us the power to serve as he asks us to. That's why you can't make up things to do for God if you want the power to do it. You follow him, what he asks you, and he will give you the power to do that. But if you come up with stuff on your own, he'll say, do it on your own, and you won't have the power. You'll get crushed. That's how you burn out. That is how you burn out in the Christian. So again, in Proverbs 25, 6, and 7, it says, Do not claim honor in the presence of the king. And do not stand in the place of great men, for it is better that it be said to you, come up here, than for you to be placed lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. So it is exactly the opposite of what Satan did. Satan grasped, and he's still doing it, grasping power. And all through the Bible, it says the way to glory is to humble yourself, and then God will, at the appropriate time, raise you up. That's right. Billy Graham said, and I got this second hand, Andy Woods saying that Billy Graham said that you want to avoid three things in ministry, three G's, the gold. So you don't want to embezzle the funds, the girls, no sexual immorality, in other words, and the glory. You, you know, if someone says, oh, that was great, you know, you did a great job, you know, praise the Lord. The Lord did it. The Lord empowered it. It's the Lord's doing. It's not my doing. And that'll keep you out of trouble. You're glorifying God there because he tells us to meet together. That's fellowship. So as you obey God, say, okay, because you say so, I will do that. You know, if you obey God, then you're glorifying God. And that's how we become his friend also, is to obey him. So verse 5, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So Jesus is deity. That's what he's stating there. Um, He is eternal. He is uncreated. He was not created. He was always. And he just put on flesh and became human. And thank you for that. Because otherwise we'd be in a world of hurt. Okay, any anything more about that section? I think this idea of glory is very important to remember. Because we, you know, we can feel good when we do stuff to the Lord. And we need to attribute that to him. Jesus manifested Father's name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. Again, there we see that concept and the divine side of election there. The Father gave them to him. But it says, they have kept your word. How are you doing in keeping his word? That's how we show we love him. That's what John 14 told us. And we can't do it perfectly. We don't do it perfectly. But we do it gradually better over life. Um, so... And that is the way to personal blessing. The way to personal blessing is keeping God's word. Jesus said in the chapter about the woman on the well, I have food to eat which you don't know about, to do the will of him who sent me. So it's nourishing to do God's will also. So when you keep God's word, you will be out of step with society. You will stick out like a sore thumb, and you'll draw persecution. But there will be joy in it because... That is where joy comes from. <laughs> joy comes from following God's will. You know, the joy that doesn't that doesn't matter what's going on around you. That's the kind of joy we want. The the good stuff, you know, the stuff that lasts, that is doesn't matter if it's raining or sun sunshiny outside, doesn't matter if somebody's sick or around you or not, it doesn't matter. That's what we want. And Jesus was complimenting them that disciples were kind of goofballs sometimes you know they're like well they didn't know what he was talking about many times and because they're people just like we are but they kept his word and they were and are blessed you know they're going to rule over the 12 tribes of israel now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you in verse 7 i wrote down john three twenty-seven here and i can't remember why i did it ah this is john the baptist This is a true statement. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing 
unless it has been given him from heaven. Everything you have, God has given you. Paul said that to the Corinthians too. He says, what do you have that you did not receive? Because they were kind of boasting about their spiritual gifts. Everything that we have is given to us by God, and we need to thank him for those things. In verse 11, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name. Jesus is asking the Father to keep them because he is leaving so he cannot protect them directly. And we need to be kept because we're in enemy territory. So what are some of the things the Lord has given us for protection as we live here now in Tacoma, Washington, in enemy territory? And he gives us an armor, which we are expected to put on. So that is some of the obedience that we can be protected by it. So this is Ephesians 6 through uh, 18, very famous passage. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we fight the angels and their false doctrines. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and have done everything to stand firm. So that's a command to take up the full armor of God. We should do that every day. And then it says, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Okay, so we want to know the truth. The truth is here. So that means we should read the Bible. We want to know the truth. And that girds your loins. And then having put on the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness comes when we obey Christ's commands. David let his breastplate down, and the devil shot an arrow into his chest when he looked at Bathsheba. And look at the price he paid for that. So you want to put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So we want to be ready to share the gospel. We want to be ready. If an opportunity comes up, in addition while taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. This is very important. You know, you need to believe that God's word is true. And when you're doing what God says and things start going bad, you have to believe it that it was the right thing to do, because almost always bad things will happen when you begin to serve the Lord. When you begin to serve, bad things will happen. Why? Because there is an enemy who does not want you to succeed. He does not want God to succeed. And he is always, he is very diligent. Satan doesn't, he has very good work ethic. You have to continue to believe that God's work is true, God's word is true, even when there's a setback which there will be. And take the helmet of salvation, this protects your brain, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With prayer, all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So you should pray like crazy, and you'll be protected from satanic attack through those things. So basically, we need to read the Bible. We need to believe what the Bible says to us, which is mainly the epistles, the commands of the epistles. And we need to believe it even when, as we act on it, resistance raises up. It's to be expected. And then verse 12 is a very interesting verse. While I was with them, the disciples, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. I guarded them. Not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. The son of perdition is who? Who is Jesus talking about here? The son of perdition? It's Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus. Jesus, you know, Judas had left before this prayer. And Jesus said, go do what you do quickly. When Judas went out, the Gospel of John also tells us that Satan entered him. Satan entered him. So he was possessed by Satan when he went to betray Jesus. And I've mentioned this before, but there's only one other person in Scripture that is given this title, son of perdition. My translation says son of destruction. And that's in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3. says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come, that is the tribulation period, or the day of the Lord will not come, Unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. That is the Antichrist, and he's given the same title. 
son of destruction, son of perdition. So that is why I believe that he is possessed by the devil at the midpoint of the tribulation period. Well, let's go on and look at section C, Jesus prays for joy, verses 13 through 19. God's word gives us joy. Jesus is talking to his father, verse 13, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. He is speaking God's word in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. So there's a little verse in Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah lived in a time where things were not that joyful. Jeremiah lived well, he started in the time of King Josiah, who was actually a good king, but his ministry went into Jehoiakim and uh, Zedekiah, where, you know, and eventually the Babylonians put Jerusalem under siege, and they were so hungry they started to eat their own children. And uh, so it was not a happy time. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16 says this, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. So God, God's word produces joy, even during judgment. Yeah, I think there's something to that. To, you know, prayer meeting is very uplifting, you know, and, and we pray out loud together in prayer. And it's very uplifting. You know, I, when I leave from prayer meeting, I'm pretty euphoric, usually. I'm pretty happy. I feel good. It's like almost like a drug, really, because I, you know, I, I just feel good when I'm driving home. So verse 14, verse 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. <clears throat> when we follow the Lord, we break out of the world's mold if we are disciples, not if we are believers. We can be a believer and be in the world's mold still. But when we decide, because we have the resources now, to obey the Lord after we believe, we will break out of the world's mold, and that is where, where we start to get resistance. So Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul says, Because of what Jesus has done and everything he has given us, he says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So it's logical that you give the Lord your body for his use because of what he's done. And then he goes on to say, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So, see, when we're in the world, it's like we're in the matrix. And Jesus is like Morpheus, <laughs> who is breaking us out. I don't know if anybody's it, it, it watched The Matrix. First time I saw that movie, I'm like, what? It freaked me out. But <clears throat> it's like that, you know. The world has us conformed to its mold. We grow, grow up, especially if we grow up in the public schools and things like that, we believe certain philosophies, which are ungodly philosophies. And we start to read the Bible and we're like, that doesn't, that's not what I was taught. And we break out of that mold. Verse 15, I do not ask you to take them out of the world. That's a sad line. <laughs> I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. We are not to be taken out of the world. Satan is in control, but we are to remain because God has plans for us. He has plans. That's why he saved us. One of the reasons he saved us, you know, he saved us because he loves us, but he also saved us because he has plans for us. And you know, a lot of churches think they're, they're kingdom building, and that is false. They're not kingdom building. But 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We are in the foreign service of heaven. We're to represent the values of heaven. That's what we're here for, to represent the values of heaven and tell the lost how they can be legally immigrated <laughs> into heaven by a very simple thing, trust in Jesus. And you can immigrate and be a heavenly citizen also. Yeah, we're citizens of heaven, but we're here on earth, and, uh, you know, we're also citizens of Pierce County. And uh, we, you know, if we're following the Lord the way we should, we represent the values of heaven to a a world that needs it. So and we will be more and more effective 
the more we grow in our progressive sanctification. When you're first saved, you're not worth much. But as you as you start to read the Bible and you now understand it, because the Holy Spirit has a ministry of illumination for the believer, and you understand it, it makes sense to you, then the Lord will can use you. And that is why, if we do that, we will be exalted at the, in due time. Okay, verse 17. This is very important. This ha- relates to our denomination, Evangelical Free Church. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Then put that alongside verse 23. I in them and you in me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. The Free Church emphasizes verse 23 at the expense of verse 17. The Free Church has changed their doctrinal statement twice since I've been a part of it. One in 2008, one in 2019. In 2008, they removed a biblical doctrine from the statement of faith, and that is imminency, which is the idea that the rapture could happen today. That is the pre-tribulational rapture that they were proposing in 1950. They removed it in 2008. Why did they remove it? Because there were some groups that didn't believe it. So they wanted unity at the expense of truth. And they, in uh, 2019, they also removed the premillennial return of Jesus Christ. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to include all millennial churches. So that is, again, unity at the expense of truth. That is why we went back to the 1950 statement because the 1950 statement is more truthful than the more modern statement is. And also in 2008, they introduced a social justice component, which the church is not called to do. Social justice is Marxism. And so that's why we went back. And that's why we're kind of the redheaded stepchild now. But, you know, it's okay. Sometimes following the Lord, you get in trouble with your Christian friends, too. So let me uh, finish this. uh, So section D, Jesus prays for unity, verses 20 through 26. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that's us, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. So Jesus here is praying for us specifically. Verse 20 says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. And that is us. Because they wrote the scriptures the New Testament scriptures. Verse 23 again, the error is to see unity without remembering verse 17. Yes, Jesus wants us to be unified, but our unity must be around the truth. And if we have to jettison the truth to get unity, it's not worth it. We, we unify with those who agree with scripture and scriptural doctrines. And if they decide they don't want to agree with that, we say, okay, that breaks our fellowship. Verse 24, once this prayer is answered, we will always be with him. He says, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. That will happen at the rapture. He will take us to the Father's house. We will come back with him to the earth to rule for a thousand years. And uh, we will not be apart from him after that. That is when that prayer will be answered. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 describes the rapture of the church where Jesus takes us. And at that moment, we are placed in resurrection bodies and we go to heaven for seven years. So we're the heavenly people, but we only spend seven years in heaven. And then we come back to the earth to rule with him. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. That's the... That's probably the most extensive rapture passage in the Bible. And that's chapter 17. Amen.